What's up, guys, and welcome to BitCast episode 120 for the month of May 2024. I'm your host, Jake Martin, and on the mics, as always, we have Landry Smith. What's up, dude? What? Dude, what's up? Good to see you. Good to see you. 120, that's a good round number, yeah? Yeah, well done, man. Round number, is that even the terminology, like... In, in math what you know i'm not a math guy jake but I, I am i was wondering what episode was the first episode i was on i think it was either like 37 or 53 Ooh. or something like that i'm I trying to think remember. about that too it was it, it was wasn't further along 2018 wow how how time flies indeed man six years later and here we are in episode 120 but we're doing it month by month now so the progress is slow but you know the, the camaraderie is is strong the camaraderie <laughs> is strong all right well y'all if you are tuning in we are discussing the month in gaming news we have a new soapbox segment at the end of that that we'll reveal later uh game and watch where we're looking at the next month's games seeing what you each should kind of be checking out what y'all should be playing game of the month club and then name that game music everyone's hit favorite segment i'm still coming off of an embarrassing <laughs> embarrassing loss last week or month really really shameful performance and uh i've just kind of really i thought about it and i think i'm just gonna retire (laughs) well i think i'm just done that was one of the comments uh yeah if people out there are just you know everyone thinks that they're a a video game music genius until they hear a song on 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 the spot and they're like i don't know i don't know what that song is but well i'm sorry that i don't rock to chamber music in my spare time but (laughs) it's been a long time since uh i've given that one a go but there's no excuse i like what you said i like like what you said to me you're like there's uh there's only so many things that you can keep in your brain and that was one thing that i decided i didn't want there anymore so i just kicked kicked it out you know had to wipe it clean man (laughs) had to make space for something else hey i'm pretty sure though i said metroid which is like another you know same thing basically space marine essentially so we're in the same boat you honestly could swap those soundtracks out and i think it would work in halo is a little more like Oomph, like it's in your face uh so, you got some rock some guitars yeah. going in that one if you want it but you know that's all right well Today, let's move on from yeah. like my the lowest moment <laughs> of my whatever this, career whatever this is yeah your gaming career <laughs> sure yeah well so yeah if you guys are listening be sure to write into us leave reviews we appreciate that we'll read them off on the show and if you have some questions we might in, engage in those and also uh you know, Landry and I might talk about some of the questions you guys write into us. So please do that. And you can write into bitcast at bitbloggers.com. I'll see those coming in. And let's jump over to the month in gaming news. So yeah, we're talking about the biggest news from the month, the month of May, with our own curated selection. So you don't have to get bogged down. This is for the folks again that may not have the time to check in and read all the news. Landry and I, we got you covered. These are the highlights. These are the highlights. And maybe some lowlights. I don't even know. But Landry, why don't you start us off with the uh, first story of the month? Square Enix is done with exclusivity. In its latest earnings release, Square Enix reports a profit drop of 69.7% year over year, thanks in part to MMO and mobile declines, and also growing operating losses from high dev cost amortization even if (laughs) sales are up slightly but the company has made it clear it plans to make the most of those high development costs with releases on more platforms and square enix will aggressively pursue a multi-platform strategy that includes nintendo platforms playstation xbox and pc it says so basically what they're saying is final fantasy 7 rebirth that screwed us (laughs) <laughs> on the PlayStation 5, and we are no longer going to do that. They do a lot of exclusives for Nintendo, too, like time exclusives. Yeah. So I think what, they're just going to look for a multi-plat strat in the future. What they're really saying is, we want more money, and we're tired of not making more money, so we're going to do this now. That's the goal. There you go. <laughs> All right, up next, we had Microsoft closing Tango and other studios. Uh, so yeah, this was kind of a sad one. Microsoft closed Bethesda Studios, Arcane Austin, Tango Gameworks, citing reprioritization redfall dev canceled some uh, like arcane leone unaffected amid industry-wide layoffs drawing criticism for lack of support for developers um so yeah i think there was like in total four studios actually closed this little um subject didn't cover everything but the big the big loss really was tango gameworks they're the the folks that made hi-fi rush like a recent huge hit for xbox came to game pass 
um arcane austin also known for like redfall stuff um they that game didn't perform very well they they got shut down and then everything everything else kind of got consolidated to other areas so kind of a bummer super bummer bummer. super bummer and uh, we'll kind of talk about microsoft as a whole a little bit uh, a little bit later in the show so let's go to the next one then landry also quick just clearing this up, uh, the thing I read was from Forbes.com, and what you read was from IGN. And next month, we'll try and get the the bylines on there, like the authors of of who we're quoting from. But didn't get it this time. That's okay. Yeah, that that uh, comes from Wesley, Wesley Yin Pool from IGN. Sorry. Oh, right on. Uh, Assassin's Creed Shadows was announced. Fans got their first glimpse of the game this week via a cinematic trailer that introduced dual protagonists. Neo, a female ninja, and Yasuke, who's based on a real-life figure often referred to as the African Samurai. This is going to release in November 12th, 2024. Uh, What do you think about this, Jake? Were you an Assassin's Creed Shadows fan? Are you an Assassin's Creed fan? I'm not a big Assassin's Creed guy. Um, I never really have been, but I love the setting. I love rural Japan or feudal Japan. This is going to be kind of a cool setting, and I know this is like something fans have been asking for for a long time so yep i'm in the same boat looks cool probably not my thing uh maybe i'll go back and play black flag sometime i liked assassin's creed 2 a lot and that write-up comes from the bbc andrew rogers and tim tom richardson all right up next we have uh nintendo acquiring shiver entertainment this comes from nintendo life uh written by liam i think doolin yep there it is got it uh, just real, real top story. Nintendo said it would acquire 100% of outstanding shares of Shiver and make it a wholly owned subsidiary with its aim to secure high level resources for porting and developing software titles. Uh, so sh- they worked with Shiver for a long time already. Um, and they were previously owned by like Embracer and they helped mm-hmm. port games like Mortal Kombat 1 and Hogwarts Legacy to the Switch, which both weren't great ports, TBH. Yeah, but uh, Hogwarts Legacy ran ran at least uh, mortal kombat 1 was nigh unplayable but mortal kombat 11 which they also did did run pretty well so i think it's just you know mortal kombat 1 probably just was too much yeah it's too too late in the the console's lifespan and for them to get these massive games running on the switch is an is an achievement in itself i mean they're not at least going kind of the uh square route where like there's the cloud-based versions of like kingdom hearts and stuff that no yeah, one wants might as well not even exist right so this is i mean that may be kind of how these operate i need to look more into how hogwarts legacy functions but i'm sure I'm, I'm assuming this is in preparation for the switch too and they're just like we yeah. need your help getting some more titles onto the switch too so come it's on cool, in it's a cool move uh that was from um, they were they bought them off embracer group right so mm-hmm. Embracer Group's probably having like a little fire sale. They're kind of selling off assets, and Nintendo probably picked them up on the cheap. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's all speculation. But um, up next, we have IGN Entertainment acquires Gamer Network, and this is from Wario64 on Twitter. Great follow. If you don't follow him, you should. <laughs> IGN Entertainment acquires Gamer Network, games, which is gamesindustry.biz, Eurogamer, Rock, Paper, Shotgun, VG247, and Dicebreaker. Jeez. So they own mm-hmm. like every video game website now. What's the point, Basically. everyone? New owner makes <laughs> uh, redundancies across the gamer network portfolio. That's crazy, man. I mean, I don't think a lot of attention has been given to this, and probably it should be, because these are like a lot of the websites that I visit. And I'm pretty sure they now own um, Nintendo Life and Push Square as well. They do not. With, they don't. They are all separate entities of like Hookshot Media. Um, so they're all unaffected by this, I believe. Okay. Because um, I saw cool. a few people from those different outlets reaching out after this had, had happened. So yeah, actually on, on that tweet, if you click on it, it says Hookshot responds and says, our ad sales partner Gamer Network was, acqu- was acquired by Ziff Davis. We want to clarify that our teams at Nintendo Life, Push Square, Pure Xbox, Time Extension 64 are unaffected by the redundancies. Well, that's good because Oof. that's like the only other uh, video games chronicles. I think is like the only other website in Nintendo Life that I visit. Push Square those, so it's good that they're not under the IGN umbrella. I love IGN personally. I think you're a big fan as well. Mm-hmm. I just don't think it's necessarily a good thing they all own all these websites. But well, and Ziff Davis is huge. They own I don't know how many other websites. Right. So it's interesting that the ig and entertainment brand itself was the one that like bought it out or like maybe that's the headline that wario 64 used but um either way i think 
yeah, consolidation has been the story for this whole month and maybe non-consolidation, why it's good and bad. Uh, and so we'll see, we'll see how this impacts the games industry, but I do know from the SEO side and like the website profitability side, Google has made it really, really hard for a lot of sites to make money and they're doing some crazy stuff right now with their new AI launch. And I'm assuming that this is IGN and or Ziff Davis trying to like future proof their investments and say, look, we're just going to go ahead and spread as far as we can. So we have these different areas pulling in money for us. Yeah. I've really enjoyed following, um, retro dodo and is it brandon Sot mm-hmm. Sot i can't remember mm-hmm. his last name yeah well i've done. enjoyed uh reading his tweets about kind of like the google search engine and stuff crazy, and kind of man. following that story it sucks because it seems like it's really affecting their brand and a lot of independent websites and stuff but it's also been really interesting reading it from someone who's going through it and reading like a detailed breakdown of stuff that I never really pay attention to mm-hmm. outside of those tweets. So that's been pretty cool. And, um, if you want to give retro Dodo a follow, um, and support them, that would be good too. That's a good website also. Yeah. They have a Patreon. Uh, they specialize mostly in like, uh, emulation handhelds, but they also do like a ton of like retro stuff and they just list yeah. off like a bunch of good old retro games all the time. And they have a bunch of developers they talk to and, Hits on all the niches that I specifically really enjoy. So, Brandon's a good dude. Check out Retro Dodo. They have a Patreon, and you guys can, uh, I'll I'll have that in the show notes for you. There you go, Brandon. (laughs) All right. uh, Up next, this uh, was a quick story, but Call of Duty Black Ops 6 will launch day one on Game Pass. Um, I I literally just, this was a story that I just pulled from Twitter. I just, this was a news line that I wrote in. That's a big deal. And I forget when the new Black Ops 6 comes out, um, but it's coming out day and day on Game Pass. Yeah, that was... uh, We'll have to talk about that in a minute. Um, We've got a lot of thoughts about that. Dragon Quest 3 HD 2D Remaster is going to still come out, which I was a little worried about personally, and I'm super (laughs) excited about this game. So, hooray. Dragon Quest 3 HD 2D Remake was announced for PS5, Xbox, Switch, and PC, which... Uh, makes sense because we'd only seen it in Switch Directs previously, but uh, with Square Enix exclusivity, yeah, exclusivity <laughs> thing that we read about earlier, uh, it looks like they're putting that into practice. It's coming 30 years after the original, which was released on the NES. Woo. Um, this yep. comes from IGN uh, Ryan Dinsdale. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm excited about this. So I have not really played any other Dragon Quest games outside of 11 on the Switch. And this is going to be in that same Octopath Traveler HD2D style. I am all in as long as that story is somewhat compelling. Uh, I think it will be, but uh, it's hard for me to speak from experience on this one. I have played the first Dragon Quest, and the story is really generic, as you might expect, it being an NES era RPG. But I will say that the gameplay is, and to me, it's just an incredibly fun gameplay loop now i know dragon quest 3 is different but in dragon quest 1 you have just one guy no party and it's it's kind of like skyrim on the nes you can go anywhere from the (laughs) beginning now you're gonna get wrecked if you go outside of like the specific area but it's just it's just a really fun kind of uh i would say like sort of mindless game where you can just like level up and watch those numbers climb very fun Uh, nice yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, the only other thing, like, surely they'll update some of the gameplay and like some of the story beats and sort of clean it up for modern stuff. Like that's that would, that would be my hope at least. They do a little more there. I would assume so. All right, and then last today, actually, as we're right before we recorded this, PlayStation had their state of play for June, and they showed off a whole bunch of game. I think it was 14 games total between PS5 and some PSVR2 games. Uh, and really, uh, the main standout for me was Astrobot is coming. Super excited about that. I think it's same. What what date? What was what was the release date for that? Oh man, I didn't catch that. Astrobot. I didn't catch the release date. It's, it's this year, which is exciting. Uh, na, 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 September sixth. So I am now officially most hyped for that game of any other games this year. Yeah, it looks so good, man. Like it does. If if Nintendo like. <laughs> If there was a comparable Nintendo game that like PlayStation has produced, it'd be like either Astrobot or like Sackboy. Like those are the two comparable in terms of like creativity, platforming, ingenuity, like cool things happening. And Astrobot, even the one that came out initially when the PS5 launched, I think is still the best 
like tech demo for like what the PS5 can do with the DualSense controller. Like it was just so like fun and like they had all those little nuanced things happening with the haptic feedback and I completely agree that it's, it's the best good. tech demo. I also personally it's my favorite PlayStation 5 exclusive. There's not a lot of competition whoa, 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 there. Whoa. Returnal's yeah, amazing. Returnal is really cool. But for me personally, for my gameplay style, I mean, I'm an, I'm yeah. a platform like that's like my Junkie. favorite genre is platformer. Yeah, yeah. So like Sackboy might be up there if it was pl- a PlayStation 5 exclusive, but it's not. Uh, I like Ratchet and Clank a lot too, but Astrobot probably good. takes the edge over that one for me. Very charming and a lot of like um, Easter eggs, you know, and oh, callbacks yeah. to other PlayStation Dude, sort of franchises. Yeah. Just, so. it, it, like it really championed the brand. Um and like I thought it, that was really cool. This trailer, I don't know if... Did you watch the trailer for this? I did, yeah. And it looks like it's doing the same stuff, but like in really cool and unique ways still. Like he has a... His, his spaceship he flies around on is literally just a PS5 like controller. controller. And so then cool. like there's a mega spaceship that he flies on and it's just a PS5. It's just a giant yeah. PS5 with jets on the back of it. And I was like, this is great. This is this is awesome. Super cool. Um, and the rest of the, the, the state of play was kind of, you know, um, underwhelming. We did get a Silent Hill 2 trailer, which is cool. Uh, for some yeah, people I think that's gonna hit for a lot of people but it really felt like it was just a lot of like souls borns and a lot of like overwatch clones i think we got like two or three games that looked like overwatch and we got a lot of games that looked like souls you know like a dark yeah. souls game so i was like okay yep state of plays have become quite boring for me i'm glad we get them i like the updates but man you're right a lot of the same yeah so let's hit on like one major theme, uh, f- sort of, I guess, for this, just for this new segment. Um, and I think we, we talked about Microsoft kind of being the standout uh, thing to talk about this month, both with Call of Duty Black Ops 6 launching day one on Game Pass and them closing down a bunch of studios because they weren't really hitting the marks they wanted them to, um, at least in terms of like what their business plans are or what Microsoft's business plans are. So yeah, right. I think... We kind of got a clear picture this month of that and it's both like we have activision now let's go ahead and pull our ace card out and put call of duty on game pass and like let's hope that this works like what what are your thoughts on them putting call of duty on game pass i think that i mean if they hadn't done that then i would have seriously questioned like the leadership the direction over the past couple of years because that would have that would have just been absolutely absurd to me however I, I don't think that there's any denying that this is a risk at the same time. I mean, yeah. Call of Duty brings in so much money. And every year. if that doesn't pump up subscribers substantially, then this is going to be a massive flop. And if it does, more power to them. I speculate that it might not um, bring in that many subscribers. Now, I don't know if they're selling this on Xbox. I'm sure they are. Uh, but I don't know. People are going to get their Call of Duty. I just feel like there's there's the free to play version, right? Mm-hmm. How long has that been out since like they're still pumping out like annual releases? Warzone's you know? been going for forever. Um, okay. I, I forget when they actually first launched Warzone. It was shortly after Fortnite was like you know a thing. Um, but yeah, Call of Duty Warzone has been free to play for a long time, and that's got a, t- a huge player base. Well, a lot of I mean, people still play Call of Duty, just the base game. Well, that doesn't okay. So maybe what I'm thinking is just completely off base. Then, so I thought Warzone was quite quite a bit newer, but maybe maybe having it in more places will be a benefit to them. Um, yeah, let me see really quick. When did Warzone come out? March tenth, twenty twenty. So it's, it's been out for a while, but yeah, I think kind of what you're saying, this is a risk. Like if this does not work, like, like Xbox is toast, dude, like they're sunk. Yeah. Cause I mean, they got, they, I, the whole story this month also was, I, I think with Tango shutting down and be like that being such a huge blow is because Hi-Fi Rush was like really the first big win for an Xbox game studio to like put out something. Probably their high, what it's got to be one of their highest reviewed games in the yes. past few years. People loved it. It had a great art style. It was a but seemingly it's also like one of those games that like is critically celebrated in a way. Like you get a lot of like 89s, 88s, 87s on Metacritic, mm-hmm. but there's not a lot of games that stay in the kind of 
conversation as games that people bring up a lot as a unique game or a well-designed game. And Hi-Fi Rush is one of those games Mm -hmm. that people still talk about, people still reference. Um, Yeah. There's a lot of 88s and 89s that just kind of fall to the wayside. That's not one of those games. So I think as far as a critical darling and, and just a game that's slowly going to build a fan base over a long time, I think that was one of them. And I can see... A corporation looking at the numbers, looking at this is our one studio way over in Japan. Like, what's the point of keeping this? Like, and axing that. But um, it it just seems crazy to me. It seems crazy to cut that at this time when the industry is so volatile and the press for Xbox has been so bad. And, you know, uh, most people don't pay attention to that. But I think if you lose the people like me and you who are kind of, you know, talking to our friends about what to play or what should you buy or what should you get next or where are the good games at, if they lose the people like us telling people that, hey, Xbox has something going for it, then what is the Xbox brand going to look like in five to ten years? And right now, that's what's alarming to me. And, yeah, Call of Duty is going to bring in a lot of people, but... If PlayStation can get under that price point of Xbox at any point and, you know, be the Fortnite box and the Call of Duty box still, I mean, <laughs> Call of Duty box. <laughs> well, you're, I mean, you're honestly, you're, you're kind of making a joke, but that's, I do feel like Call of Duty has such um, monumental power behind it. Like there's just so much power behind that name specifically and where it's like, how it's going to lead, um, lead console sales. Like if you look at, the Xbox 360. Most people bought a 360 at that time for Call of Duty to play Modern Warfare 4 and like yeah. Halo and Halo, like the two shooters. Like that was kind of the thing. Gears of War, maybe whatever, but like it was mostly the first person shooters playing online with friends. And then what happened is PlayStation 4 came out and and PlayStation struck up like exclusivity deals with like with Call of Duty and got them to launch exclusive content and some other stuff. And they had marketing rights for for Call of Duty and sort of coined themselves or sort of associated themselves as the call of duty brand branded console so playstation 4 for that entire life cycle had call of duty sort of as its its partner brand and then the same thing happened sort of with ps5 for the first couple of years here and now that call of duty or, or sorry now that microsoft xbox they own call of duty it's going to go back to xbox and i really am curious to see like now that it's so tightly integrated into game pass like what this is going to do like it's it's it is most certainly going to bump up subscribers but yes. it w- will it be enough and it will it will it offset the potential earnings they could have had if people were just buying the game outright full price every year? You right. know, I don't know. Because because for me, a person that plays first person shooters every now and then, uh, Call of Duty is one of them that I've always enjoyed. But like, I don't play every single one and I only play them for like two months. So... So for me, like if I was if I was a Game Pass subscriber and like Call of Duty had just come out, it's like okay, yeah, I'll, I'll resubscribe for two months to play Call of Duty and then I'll unsubscribe. And if you, yeah, so you're that's interesting because you, yeah, you might go two months, so you're only spending thirty dollars there. But mm-hmm. like, what about the people who play Call of Duty and that's it, right? It would be a lot more of like economically that. advantageous for them to buy a $70 game on a PlayStation and just have that all year long rather than pay $15 a month. Mm-hmm. Now there's probably studies done on why people don't do that. I'm not sure if that would be a thing, but to me, it seems like those people who just play that game, the smart decision would be just to stick with whether it's the Xbox or PlayStation, game. just buy the full price game. And then you have access to it all year long and call of duty. This is not my wheelhouse. I'm assuming (laughs) Call of Duty is one of those games that once you buy it, you can still buy skins and other things Mm -hmm. for it and still pump money into it. Yep. I'm sure there's a lot of people like that, right? I I do play, what I play that's very similar is 2K, the NBA 2K games, Madden, stuff like that. Right. And I'm never one of those guys who's going to buy, like I'm not going to spend $10 on like VC credits, but Mm -hmm. you know, what happens is the playoffs come around and then you can get like an absurd amount of VC credits for like three bucks. And like, have I ever taken the plunge on that? Yes. But you know, th- that's <laughs> like, yes, unless I'm getting like a crazy deal, like I'm not going to do that, but there are people who spend tons and tons of money on this stuff. Yeah. And that's probably what Xbox is looking at mostly is like, 
listen, every time somebody's putting money into Call of Duty, we're getting a piece of that pie. I think the yeah. ultimate goal for them is more subscribers. Yeah, I mean, if if that's the way to get Call of Duty for a lesser cost, and if that comes with some extra benefits because it's on on Xbox, I know that there's like that parity agreement that they signed for like ten years, where any game that comes out on Xbox from or Call of Duty specifically is gonna, you know, there's there's not gonna be any disparity between the Xbox version and any other like version that it launches on PC or um, PlayStation. So they have to kind of stick to that and offer the same exact game. And yeah, I don't know what the benefits are going to be other than they're they're getting the monetary gains now. So like if people are buying it on PlayStation, that money is going to Xbox. So how long has Call of Duty like Modern Warfare came out? What, 2004? So it's been 20 years running is like pretty much one of the flagship video games. Monstrous. Just yeah. So in the next 10 years, it probably will still be in the same boat. I guess they're assuming or hoping it will be. Um, but you never know, man, like in the nineties, it was counter-strike and, um, counter strikes still going counter strike still going. I'm sure it's not the big cash cow that, uh, call of duty is, but, and now, I mean, Fortnite's probably eclipsed. I would imagine. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Fortnite's call of Duty's, making so much money, uh, but money, call of duty so, still has its crowd. So it does. Yeah. I think it's a little more hardcore. Wouldn't you say, I would mm-hmm. say probably, um, yeah, probably. Who knows? Who knows when the next thing is going to come along though and take that player base? So, in ten years, Call of Duty may be irrelevant. And there's so many people already trying that. I mean, I didn't put this on the list, but um, a game called X Defiant came out this month that is it plays just like Call of Duty and it feels great and it's free to play. Oh wow, it's free to play. And I was like, this game is pretty dang pretty dang good for being free to play. Like it really feels just like Call of Duty in, in most ways. There's like a few minor tweaks that they could make to make it just perfect, but for what it is for being free, I'm like, this is amazing. So, I mean, they, I don't know, man. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. And now what, that I think, I think I saw yeah. that they're also, they're also fighting a lawsuit for like shoot, shooting games being related to something else, like Call of Duty specifically. So they, they're going to, they're going to be in legal stuff for a while with this. They can never the, escape it. The thing about Microsoft, though, that we haven't really touched on is what they're kind of setting themselves up to to be with the developers they work with. And that is, I think an environment that creates, that's really horrible for creativity, right? Mm -hmm. You have to make a game that's on budget that does well critically. And if you're not both of those things, you're in jeopardy of getting axed essentially. And working under that kind of pressure is uh, it can't be good for creativity, right? How are you going to take risks when, um, you know, you know if, when all that's on the line? Like, even if Xbox greenlights a creative project, how can you work without that kind of piece of under knowing that your yeah. job's going to be there the next day? You know what I mean? So, like, if you're on one of those art house creative projects, you can maybe take some pride in what you're doing and put all of your work into it, and maybe it's received like a 90 on Metacritic and it's thought of as a well-designed game for years to come. But at the same time, is that game going to, um, yeah. Know, is it, is it, is it making be money? The black? Is it and making it, money? And, and in such a way that Microsoft's not going to give, give you the ax because at the end of the day, it's not Xbox, right? If it was just the Xbox brand that decided, made all these decisions, then you know, I'm sure Tango Gameworks and all these other, maybe not Tango. The whole fact that that's a Japanese company is like, or a Japanese development partner, mm-hmm. that seems like that had to have been the reason why they they got rid of that one. That's too hard seems, for them to manage, yeah. I guess. But I mean, I don't, know. I don't know. I feel like this is just in a bad direction when you're when you are under the umbrella of a trillion dollar company that is catering to investors. Mm-hmm. Um, not that Sony and Nintendo aren't these massive corporations. It just seems like Xbox is uh, is different. Microsoft is stepping it's American. in now. Microsoft is stepping in now. They gave yeah. X, they gave Xbox seventy eight billion dollars to make this acquisition, and they're looking a lot more closely now at the finances and saying, "Okay, we're gonna start making some calls now too because we gave you this money. So we're gonna have a hand in how these decisions are made and." we're going to start with these studios that we see as problematic and say they're gone. Yeah. And like, that sucks. Like that sucks. Yeah. Dishonored, uh, is an incredible video game. Uh, yeah. you know, and that was arcane, I believe made that, um, yep. 
You know, and in the last game they made Pray. was a critical flop. Uh, yeah, Prey Prey is good too, and uh, I never played that one. What was on the, the the moon moon spinoff or like uh, DLC for it? Like everyone loved, said it was yeah. super good. Oh, people talk about Prey all the time. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. So, anyways, that was pretty much the news for the month. But yeah, I am curious to see how this all pans out for Microsoft. Are they going to just sort of devolve into a software company? You know, we've been talking about it for a while, but that seems to be. That seems to be the route that they're going to continue to go, especially as they focus down on these big blockbuster titles that they just need subscribers for. So, yeah, we didn't even talk about Hellblade: Sinuous Sacrifice. I don't even think that's in our like highlights. Oh yeah, this month, and that's it's, it's, we'll talk about it. it yeah, was, actually, it should have been a highlight but. in a in the game release section right now. Let's talk about it. So, real quick, uh, this month we had a few pretty good games come out actually this is a strong month for like pretty good games but there were a lot of indie games which is kind of cool a lot of games people would were not expecting to do well so um 1000 x resist came out may 9th uh got an 84 percent. that's on pc right now but people love that game animal well ps5 switch pc uh may 9th this is big mode aka uh, video game donkey's first uh game that he's released as part of his publishing company and that got an 89 percent, very well uh received by most people uh, Crow Country, um, a PS1 sort of throwback horror survival game. Um, PS5, Xbox Series X, PC came out May 9th, got an 82, also received well. Lorelei and the Laser Eyes, this is like a super cool puzzle game. They came out on Switch PC on May 16th, got an 88%. People are loving that game a lot. And then we got Senua's Saga Hellblade 2, uh, Xbox Series XS and PC, May 21st, 81%. And then Paper Mario Thousand Year Door on Switch, May 23rd. 88% on open critic. Um, so yes, anyway, saga that the, the story there really is, um, you know, before the game launched, I don't know if you saw this, but like the developer came out and said, Hey, making a video game is hard. And like, we're super happy about this, how this turned out. And we hope you guys like it. You know, it was kind of like a, a, a so the way I read it was kind of like a precursor, like kind of a warning of like, they kind of knew they were going to get some pushback as soon as this game launched. Yeah. They were like, oh, okay, here we go. Huge vote of confidence. <laughs> yeah, here we go. I'm a little nervous about our game coming out. And I think they, they probably had a good thumb on, or a, a good gauge on the pulse of people that were going to be uh, reviewing it. And it reviewed okay. Like you had a good swath of people that were like, this is incredible. It's pushing the medium forum, the medium forward graphically this is the best thing i've ever seen it's unreal 5 amazing but then everyone's like it's not very fun though it's not really a game it's just kind of like combat's worse than the previous senua saga and it's kind of just it's so it's such a weird thing man like the metacritic score looks good i've heard three or four i've listened to three or four podcasts about this game and no one talks positively about it yeah. Like they'll say it looks pretty, but it's supposed to be a narrative game. And people talk about how it's not a good, like necessarily a great narrative story. Like it tries to right. do things that it doesn't succeed at. It's about the five game hours plays long. boring. It's not very long, which I think is a positive. Um, but um, <laughs> yeah, so it's weird. There's so many times in the game industry where you get a game. Final Fantasy Rebirth was kind of like this, where it scores really high and somehow the rhetoric around it, the conversation around it is almost as negative as it is positive. And in Hellblades, <laughs> yeah. in Hellblades, uh, I was not expecting it to score in the 90s. I don't think anybody was. I thought it scored about as high as I expected it to. Yeah. But then the conversation turns negative. And that is a very strange thing to me. Uh, it's a very, I, you don't get that in other conversations like movies you know like if a movie is 80 and rotten tomatoes and you're listening to podcasts talk about it they're gonna be celebrating all of the positive things about it and maybe talk about a few of the criticisms at the very end mm -hmm. video games have earned this weird space where i think a lot was riding on hellblade's shoulders yeah but there's just a lot of times where i think in video games you get the people who they have reviewing these games are kind of fan boys, fan girls of the specific genre, the specific IP, the specific brand. The console. Yeah. It might be a subconscious thing. It might be a more overt thing, but that affects the score and the Metacritic of the score. I don't think there's anything necessarily malicious at play here, but then 
when you hear, get it in even some more critics' hands, and that's where you get to hear some of these podcasters talk about it, the conversation immediately turns negative. And that's kind of where I feel you can almost get a better pulse on what the game's actually like. And mm-hmm. it seems like Hellblade kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's it's so weird to compare it to film or like Hollywood. You know, you wouldn't have a fan base being mad that the game released in Lucasfilm, they, you know, made a Star Wars movie or something like that. And like, oh, this this new Lucasfilm movie, like, oh, it, it, it was supposed to be a lot better, but it sucks. But I still think it's really good because it's a Lucasfilm game, you know, and it's like, like there's there's almost this brand association. And I think I texted you guys being so like burnt out on that. I think that day when Senua came out, there was just so many ding dongs on both <laughs> sides just being so like, when will the console war bullshit stop dude it's it truly is exhausting and it's just like stop stop it stop it just don't don't do this don't don't just say like oh another flop for xbox game studios yeah yeah you guys should come over to all these xbox fanboys man you guys are so full of yourselves like this is another turd what you guys why don't you guys stop playing games on xbox come to playstation and it's just like just stop it's so just stop what happens i think is that people are Maybe not. I shouldn't say people, okay? Like, I'm not going to lump everybody in the one category. I think that a lot of loud voices make themselves, like, squeaky wheel gets the grease kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But a lot, like, a lot of those squeaky wheels are people like me and you who maybe don't have a lot of interest outside of gaming and were raised. Like, if I was raised and the only literature that I read was gaming magazines from the 90s. Yeah. And then the only things I watched was X play in the two thousands. And then the only <laughs> thing that I read was comments on IGN and Twitter and uh, you know, the 2010s, then I would probably have this be ide- a ideology of, I have to fight or argue every single point with nasty rhetoric, uh, you know, on every single idea that I hold true or even uh, just that I hold dear to myself. And that's kind of like the way it is like video game rhetoric in the nineties was all fueled by like marketing campaigns that were kind Mm -hmm. of hilarious, but also kind of savage. And then X play kind of built on this idea. And that was like the cable television on G4 TV. But when, to my knowledge, it was like still very mainstream video game kind of centric. They had a really kind of nasty way of talking about things, not necessarily like vulgar, but uh, they were rude and kind of crude and had like attitude with the way they talked about stuff. And then, you know, IGN, the 2010s, not nearly as politically correct as you might assume if you were in <laughs> like reading, you know, listening to all the hosts in 2024, how hundred hottest video game characters of all time. You know, <laughs> yeah, like absolutely. Like it was like, uh, definitely some like kind of cringy stuff on their website back in the day. And mm-hmm. the comment sections were absolutely insane. It was like, there were not moderators doing the job that they do now back then. So right. I don't know, like video game culture, like, to me, I can see the path for why it's so incredibly annoying and horrible now. But at the same time, there's no excuse for it. In my head, what I've done is I every time someone is talking on Twitter or in a comment section like a complete idiot, I just assume they're in the eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> and it helps me out a lot. I'm just like, all right, well, let me they- redirect the conversation here. They have they have a few years to grow up. Like they're still growing up. They're <laughs> figuring things out. Anyways, yeah. we we got sidetracked. Sorry about that. But yes, Senua Saga Two did not re- review well, and from what I listened to as well from a few people, they were not super thrilled with it. Like everyone had to say the same thing. They're like graphically incredible, like sound design amazing, but game game wise narrative, I don't know what this dude. Game it is. looks sick. It like yeah. visually, it's stunning. Yeah. I didn't think that visuals could like get a game, a good score in 2024, (laughs) but it seems like that's what's happened. And to be honest, I get it. The graphics are pretty insane. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. All right. Uh, Let's jump over really quick to interesting, funny bits, worst uh, Twitter takes. 
so this is kind of a fun little bit. Lander, we got some new, te- need, yeah, new details about the Super Nintendo World expansion. So Super Nintendo World is coming to Universal Epic Universe in 2025 with Mario Kart, Yoshi's Adventure, Donkey Kong Country attractions, and more interactive experiences. Yeah, pencil me in for 2026. Me and my family will be going. I'm not Donkey Kong one. Country, you're in on that one. I know it. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> I am there. The, the ride looks so sick. I have a rule, Jake, about restaurants. I will not go to a new restaurant within the first three months of it being open. Smart man. Because, first of all, I've Crowds. been part of like opening a lot of restaurants, and I know that you have to work out of the kinks, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you go on like the first week there's a really good chance you're going to be waiting a very long time for your food and a very long time for a table because everyone wants the hot new thing. Smart man. Also a really good chance. You're not going to get the best quality stuff because people are still figuring it out. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So with a theme park, I'm 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 going to apply (laughs) my same practice because I think that it's going to be so crazy and so crowded for the first year and they're going to be working out the kinks, right? So maybe 2026, summer comes around, maybe a little early, like spring. I don't know. Not like spring break time, but maybe like late May, something like that. Maybe that's when I'll go. Sounds sorry. I'll be six around then. I'm excited about that though. Like I, I've, I've yet to go, but you're absolutely right. Like wait until they've finally gotten everything built and it's not chaotic and they've figured out how to get people through doors and through experiences a lot faster. So that way you're not stuck waiting for yeah, dude. I want to be able to coffee from the Toad Cafe. Collect as many keys, find all the Pikmin. I want to be able to like see all the stuff. Also, I've heard on some Reddit posts that if you go at night, it's a lot less. Ooh. crowded which makes a lot of sense because it's probably a lot of kids in the, in the daytime all the families go home yeah and it looks cool like i saw some youtube videos of like how the parks lit up at night it looks sick dude let's go me and you we'll just go at night we'll just let's you know it. all all parenting responsibility is gone we're just going to the parks having a fun time we'll just leave them at the pool at the hotel <laughs> gotta, gotta have a kitty pool right here's here's a here's some floaties have fun <laughs> All right, so let's finish this out with our soapbox segment um, on Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door. You had a funny little thought on how this game is being reviewed right now by a lot of people who likely grew up with the original and how that may or may not be impacting review scores. Yeah, I just think I have a really hard time believing that Paper Mario, the Thousand Year Door is that good of a game. (laughs) <laughs> I've played Paper Mario. i played Super Mario RPG. I grew up with Super Mario RPG. I like those games. I think they are fun. I wouldn't score them above a seven. And the reason being is that they're just kind of like grow tired after a while. I do think the humor is funny, but it kind of gets a little stale after a 20 to 30 hour adventure. Mm. I've heard that this game is like 30 to 60 hours. That's a little terrifying to me with the combat system that's in place. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I don't know, man. I just cannot see this being a nine or a 10. Yeah. Uh, So uh, what are your feelings? You're playing it and you grew up with it and you speak very highly of it. And I respect your opinion and hold it very dear. Well, what do you think? You, you got a taste of some of my critiques in our group chat. Um, yes. But, you know, even playing this at the time on the GameCube, I remember not being as excited to, like, get back into it on the GameCube. Whereas, like, Paper Mario, like, I could not get enough of it. I, went, I wanted to finish that. We loved that game. But on the GameCube, for Thousand Year Door, I remember just kind of, like, blasting through it and, like, make it kind of, it felt tedious at the time. And that's still here in this game. There's like some small solves that I think I've already picked up on. There's like a pipe room, but it feels more like an eight to me. Like it's, it's a great game. It's great. Visually great rework soundtracks. Good in most scenarios. Some, some minor fixes. Like it just, it's just, it's a great switch game. Like this is one that you should definitely pick up if you like RPGs and you're a fan of like that kind of combat. Uh, But I do, I do, I do kind of teeter on that being definitely not a 10 and a nine, like, maybe like i think there's i I could see that but i do think that there's like a lot of bias towards like people just wanting this game really bad like i wanted it and then like now that i'm playing i'm like yeah yeah (laughs) you know and and between this and super mario rpg remake you know they they kind of have a similar feel where it's like dude i will i would love to pick the brain of whatever group decided to release those so close together that's such a weird for so long we just didn't have anything, and then they released some back to back like that. That's crazy to me. 
probably just a financial thing. We're like, well, we have these two in the hopper ready to go and we don't have a lot much else. So here you go. Yeah. And they're like, well, okay. Two RPGs. Two, hey, they look great. They two look old great. RPGs. So yeah, I don't know. I, I, I kind of agree with you. I think bias is playing into a lot of the high review scores here, but it is, if you look at like the full first party launches for like Switch, this this would still be up there for like one of the better ones. So cool. Well, I will definitely give it a shot when you let me borrow it. I will. I will <laughs> gladly do so. Thanks, sir. All right, let's jump into uh, Game and Watch. Uh, just looking at next month's releases that we think may be worth checking out. Not a lot coming out in June. TBH. So we got Destiny 2, the final shape. This is the last bit of DLC for Destiny 2 coming out on PS5, uh, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, PC, June 4th. Kind of cool that it's coming out on PS4, Xbox One. Yeah, very um, adequately tied, titled. Well done. Yeah, the final shape. And this is, um, uh, what's the guy's name that passed away? That voice, one of the characters. Is it Lance Reddick or something like that? That sounds familiar. I think that might be right. Hold on. I want to get this right before I... Yeah, Lance Reddick. He passed away. He voiced one of the characters in there. And there's like there's some good homages to him and his character in this as well. So that'll be kind of a fun, fun crossover. Cool. We have Elden Ring, Shadow of the Erd Tree on PS5, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, PC, June 21st. Very excited about that. I am also excited, even though I wasn't the biggest Elden Ring fan. But this has got me wanting to replay Elden Ring and really spend some time. And I'm off the entire month of July, so. Oh, that's perfect. That's I perfect know, yeah. I'll probably yeah. sink my teeth into that. Could be our game of the month. We'll see. Could be. Uh, then we have Super Monkey Ball Banana Rumble. I'm Switch. curious. I'm curious if it can pull off. Dude, I, I played the GameCube Super Monkey Ball. I texted you about this for the, like probably the first time like last year, but I mm-hmm. really spent some time with it uh, about a month ago. Dude, it's so good. It's so good. It's such a cool, unique game. Simple concept. Yep. Lots of fun. Very arcadey. You could beat it like it, it kind of plays like Smash Brothers in, in some ways. <laughs> um, you can beat like a, I didn't realize how short of a game it is, but like once you beat it, like you're not done with it. Play it on harder modes and, and get better and, and score time trials. And, yeah, it's just it's learn crazy. new tricks, ways ways to jump over different gaps and stuff by flipping Dude, the this the whole stage. <laughs> Sega back then, just firing on all cylinders. So cool. And then last but not least, Luigi's Mansion 2 HD uh, Switch June 27th. So yeah, it looks like a strong, I mean, like really two switch games at the end of the month and then we got two kind of older games i mean it's crazy that elden ring is also available on ps4 and xbox one um you know yeah. just two, two older games getting some some dlc treatments i wonder and, if uh the playstation 4 version there for a while was the best version because it ran at like a f- higher frame rate oh. and I'd, i wonder if they ever patched the ps5 version i'm sure they did um i'm sure they did too i'm sure they did but the loading times are probably much better on the ps5 so yep what's more important to you all right well that's uh that's uh june so i'm looking forward most to probably elden ring and maybe how monkey ball does yeah same i think same and then luigi's mansion 2 i have that on the 3ds maybe i'll just replay (laughs) it while everyone else plays it on the switch i just wish that it was coming out in like october like why why are we doing this in june like just uh, like it's a Nintendo ghost game. never releases their Halloween Luigi's Mansion games at the right time. They released Luigi's Mansion 3 on October 31st, if I remember correctly. Yeah, or maybe yeah it, it was, was like November after. 1st. It was like, it was like dude, after Halloween. I wanted to play this during the season, not the day that Halloween ends. Like this feels wrong to be playing a spooky ghost game in this middle of summer. Like I don't I don't know about Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Yeah. Come on Nintendo. Easy marketing choice there. Absolutely. All right. Let's jump over to our Game of the Month Club discussion. For the month of May, Landry and I got to play Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown. And so uh, I'll start with I'll start with some highs for us. Um, okay. You know, everyone loved this game, had a bunch of good reviews. So I was excited to check it out. And I'm happy to say that the reviews do it justice. It's It's a great game. I think it's expertly designed there. It's it's a lot larger in scale than I thought it was going to be. It's huge. There's a lot of places to go kind of explore. 
um, and a lot of like places to back travel to once you've kind of gotten one of the power ups that you're missing. And I love the accessibility or at least the like the, the friendly design choices that they allow you to toggle on or off if you so choose. And I did this at the very beginning. It asks you if you want the this kind of experience or this kind of experience hard, easy, you know, whatever. But then there's, uh, there's another option where it'll show you on the map where you're supposed to go next. And it also show you areas that are unlocked based on the powers that you just picked up. Dude, that's so cool. And it was so helpful because yeah. So instead of being like lost, like, okay, I just got this thing. Crap. I need to go back to this area. I think it'll show you kind of on the map, like where like a green or red door is unlocked. Like, Hey, this green door means you can come back here and like the next stage of that area can go, you can go into and then also I love the little like screenshot function that's built into the game where if you see something, you're like, I know I need to come back here. I don't know what I need to do yet. So I'm just going to screenshot this. You can hit down on the D pad. I love that. It, it'll too. grab that. And area. I love that. It's a skill that you, mm-hmm. you can upgrade and stuff. Very cool. Yeah. It's just like, there's like a lot of that. Like I think the accessibility in this game really, I think push the genre for a even further for like what a metroidvania could be in terms of like making it easier or more palatable for some people it's like you don't like backtracking that's, here you go that's where this game's gonna get its flowers i think and will always kind of have like that rung on the ladder of metroidvanias is how it solves some of the problems of the genre where you know if you're banging your head against the wall there's some really smart design concepts that don't feel like cheating that they implement here. And, you know, I don't have what that thing that tells you where to go. It's still, there's still some confusing moments, but there's never been a moment in this game where I have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. There's not been a moment. And I am pretty far. I would say like I'm at 50%, but it's one of those percentage counters. that's like, clocking everything that I get on the map. So I think I'm, yeah. I'm much farther than that. Like I probably don't have much more to go before I beat it. Um, but at every single moment in this game, there's been, oh, there's always been another part of the map I could go explore. And I haven't really felt frustrated. Um, the combat is really, really tough. We've texted a lot about like how, um, not frustrating, but how there's just a lot of pushback. And mm-hmm. one of the things I will say about the game is I don't, it was probably about, 10 hours into it, the combat just started clicking on a whole nother level with me. Like, I feel like I am a complete boss now. Like there is not a lot of stuff that I'm coming up against that is giving me a lot of trouble. The last boss that I faced, I took me three times to figure out the pattern. And then I just kind of like got rid of him really quick. And the first boss, I probably died 15 times Mm -hmm. trying to figure it out. And it was, it was all to me, it was just kind of, figuring out the flow of the combat. And I think I've got that down pretty masterfully and it makes me feel really awesome. I like it a lot. Yeah. The combat's uh, pretty satisfying. Yeah, you're right. It, it, the, the first few hours of the game, like you think you're doing okay. And then you come upon a boss or just maybe like a smaller side boss or something like that. And just, you get waxed. And I was like, Oh, okay. I need to be parrying more. I need to be dodging more. I need to be sliding under this enemy more or like, running away like there's like the game tries to push you into these these behaviors through just death it's just like oh you didn't do the right thing there you're gonna have to learn how to do that like you're gonna have to learn how to block you're gonna have to learn how to slide underneath this attack um and once you figure that out you're like okay i'm gonna do that a lot more now i'm gonna do that a lot more now and yeah encounters are a far less scary and or difficult now as a result of like that learned combat language but yeah that that initial initial part is hard and some of these puzzles man some of these puzzles are really tough like (laughs) yeah i had to look up the solution to one when you get like the time shift mechanic where you can you have you have to like duplicate yourself and you can see your you can see like where the path goes like those were the the further that one got on that that first puzzle you got to like actually unlock that skill i was like what in the world am i supposed to do for this last one like it took me forever to figure that one out there was one puzzle that I had to look up the solution to. And when I looked up the solution, I was like, is anyone else figuring this out by themselves? Like that is absolutely insane. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it was in that room where you have four, there's four doors and you yeah, have I think to it's solve the same each one. trial. Okay. Yeah, it's okay, the same yeah. one that so I struggle I like, with too. It's like, dude, this is insane. <laughs> and like the other three were really easy. So I was like, wow, the skill level just went up to like exactly the nth degree. I was like, that was crazy. That's really the only like spike in puzzle difficulty that I've had. 
I, I will before we leave like the highs i think the platforming in this game is to me the highest achievement it's so tight it's so fluid there are some real challenging moments but to me the difficulty is completely perfect it's hard but there's not been a single challenge yet and i haven't gotten to the hardest parts i know that that has pushed me to where i'm just like i'm dying a lot or anything like that but Mm -hmm. everything looks so cool like they stack it up like you have to do a lot of moves in a row to like complete like these special challenges for the coins or whatever else you're getting and dude it's just so it feels so good there's not i don't even have a double jump yet and i'm like i've got to be mostly through the game i think from where i'm, I'm at like w- with the story and everything so yeah i don't have the, the, the i think you and i are like almost in the exact same sp- spot because i don't have i don't have it either but i feel like i've progressed really far it's like i don't know why i don't have a double jump yet i know there's areas that i need it so i'm like i'll, I'll get this eventually i guess yeah um well right. i think we've talked about a lot of the highs let's talk about some of the lows or some of the areas that this game does not do as well i i I'm trying to think of like major lows that I've experienced. Um, the only thing for me was that stands out more is the upgrading system slash like fast travel system. Um, they've just patched this. I don't know if you saw that where now all of the yak trees or whatever they're called, all the trees that you go to are now also fast travel locations. So it's what? not, so That's it's not crazy. just a little like chest podiums that you find there that are near the okay. save points but every single tree now is a fast travel point. So that is yeah. one thing I would, I was not willing to criticize it for that, but as one thing I've been finding myself wanting is more fast travel points. Mm-hmm. Why aren't there more fast travel points? It would be so much. Yeah. I guess that is a criticism because one thing about this game too, that I do, I will criticize because I don't think the art style is particularly uh, outstanding personally. Mm-hmm. I won't call it generic. I won't call it a flaw, but it definitely doesn't set itself apart. When I think about this development team's past works and Rayman legends and Rayman origins, not mm-hmm. even near as memorable as those. Um, but some of the rooms are really, really big and really, yeah. really empty. And I yeah. just feel like, why did they make these giant spaces with, you know, not a lot going on in them. And like, there might be one or, I mean, it kind of makes sense with the overall area that you're in, but it doesn't make sense from a gameplay perspective, having to run across a room for six seconds, you know, Mm -hmm. seeing nothing. And there's really not a lot like of decorum in that room or anything. And that happens more than once, uh, more than multiple times, really. Yeah. Um, And then uh, like another thing that I will say about this game is that, I think it plays it pretty safe. Like I think that the music is not outstanding. The graphics aren't that outstanding. And overall the game feels like it set, it does everything it sets out to do, but because it plays it safe, I'm not sure how I will remember this in two or three years. Am I mm-hmm. going to look back on this as a highlight experience? Probably not. Am I having a blast playing it right now? Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's that's a great way of putting it. Like, it's not so memorable that you're going to, you know, like if people are like, what game should I play on, you know, on the Switch? It's like, oh, you got to play The Lost Crown. You know, like, this is the best. It's like, no, you could like, there's like four other Metroidvanias you could probably play that I'd recommend yeah, first. I would, I would probably put it, I, I was trying to think like on the Switch, what is its placement? I would say it's probably fourth for me. I would go Metroid Dread or In the Blind Forest and Hollow Knight before this. Yeah, same. But I think like Hollow Knight and this can kind of compete in different ways where like Hollow Knight wins on art style, music and sort of like taking risks on like sort of changing some things that are like not common in Metroidvanias. And this one wins in like accessibility and making making a bit more approachable, but also in some ways a little bit more forgettable. So it is really it is really similar to Hollow Knight in a lot of areas for Mm -hmm. Metroidvania in that you you have such a huge map and there may be two or three places you can go at once, you know, and, and get certain things and be fine with that. And it hollow Knight is another game where I never didn't have anywhere to go, but it was also a pain in the ass to get to the other side of the map. And I knew (laughs) I was going to be like, Oh great. I can go explore over there. It's just going to take me five to 10 minutes to get over there. And then what am I going to find over there? Like, you know, uh, a vase with some, 
blue orbs in it that I can go spend at the store for nothing. Like, like I feel like I'm going to Chuck E. Cheese and I can buy like one like, <laughs> sticker. It's like, dude, well, I wasted all that time. And the downside of Hollow Knight is if you get over to that area, but you die right before you like find a safe point, you lose all your stuff and you're like, great. Dude, I was awesome. so excited in Prince of Persia when I first died and I didn't lose any of my, I don't know what coins or whatever, shards or whatever they were. Like, yes. Yeah. I was like, dude, thank you. I'm so <laughs> tired of having to backtrack and find my stuff. And then die again and lose it anyways. So you're like, and no. actually, I think another highlight of this game is that when you die, you keep everything. And, and that mm-hmm. can be beneficial for this game because it is so expansive and you go back to that yak yak tree or whatever and you're like well cool i was like way down in the bottom corner of the map and it's still open and explored so i feel like i can go somewhere else now. Mm-hmm. yeah um so i think closing thoughts um i think this game does a lot of cool stuff i think puzzles are a standout i think accessibility is a standout and if you're looking for a really solid metroidvania this is definitely one you should pick up especially at the price that it's sitting at probably forever now and it'll it'll be cheaper soon like 30 bucks or cheaper so yeah also one one complaint i have about a ton of games especially this one lore just get rid of it like no not many (laughs) people do lore very well this game does it terribly i i can't imagine i don't know maybe you're the one and if you are i'd be surprised anybody who's read all the crap that they put the text they put up in front of you it's like dude I skip all the lore. Yeah, all the lore I'm skipping. I'm like, this doesn't really pertain to the story. It's not additive in in any particular way, but it makes me feel like I'm missing out on something, which I think is the worst kind of stuff to do. I was like, should I have read that? Was there like a hint in there for something else I needed? The prophecy that you get is like, it's not even cryptic. It's like, it will give you three words that mean absolutely nothing. And it's like, like, uh, who's putting all this? I don't know. I just think lore, like Dark Souls has done so many good things for gaming and development, but putting lore into games, just find another way to tell your story. It's, it's so dumb. Because I do think the Prince of Persia story, I was going to say, actually does have some compelling moments where like you had the cutscenes I've actually, I've been pretty cool with, to be honest. Good cutscenes, like decent, like really, I would say decent voice acting and, you know, um, animated scenes. Uh, all that's great that and that like whenever i ran into like one of the immortals or like the characters that you are there with it's kind of cool to see how they've changed over the course yeah. of the game and like it's got, how it's got a very hades style of storytelling too um yeah each time you come back they have something new to say if you have like a different power they'll like talk to you more about something else like it's yeah it's 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 cool it's cool stuff it is cool so overall i think i'm gonna lander what are you gonna score the game I'll, I'll let you go first i Hate to run a five point scale. I would give it a seven. You want you want to do a 10, 10 point scale? All right, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give it a seven. I was gonna say a high three or low four, but I'll give it a seven. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna go ahead and give it an eight. I think it's great. I'm a, I'm at a very high seven, a very positive seven as well. I, I think feel. it's a great game. I, I think you should too. definitely check it out if you're into it. And uh, you wouldn't be disappointed. I think you'll have fun with you, it. So. You won't be disappointed. It's yeah. it is it is very tightly designed. Boom. There you go. All right, and now exciting for you guys out there, our game of the month for June is Chrono Trigger, a game that I have never played and one that Landry has played. Well, I have never beaten it. I have oh. put probably, I got about 15 hours into it. Let's go, man. We can beat so it. We I'm can do it. I'm so excited to beat this game and take it off the list. I think I've had the own. like big moments spoiled for me, but maybe not. So we'll see. Oh. I'm, I'm excited to, to I don't maybe know that see. I have. I mean, I've gotten really deep into the game. I don't know what the big moment is necessarily, but cool. I I remember thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying it, and I was playing it on the Wii, and I let a friend borrow it, and it just it was like 2009. There was other stuff going on. It never came back to me. My <laughs> Wii never came back to me. Never came. The whole Wii never came back to you. Yeah. Well, I mean, like it was it was fine i mean like it i knew where it was like i could go and get it at any point oh, okay. it just was like it got to be like 2012 and i was like who wants one of these things you, you know? didn't even care anymore so, yeah i was like whatever that's crazy you're crazy man all right well let's jump over to the last segment of the show name that game music everyone's hit favorite show this time with reworked rules where we are going to be working from 20 points down 
and giving hints along the way to help each other guess the games that we are actually playing songs from. Or sorry, play guess the songs that we're playing. Yeah, you, you, you get the point. <laughs> uh, so same thing, Landry and I have picked two songs for each of us to guess. And uh, I'll start first. Okay. Uh, or actually, Does that I mean guess. I'm going to guess? You're going to guess. Okay. Are you ready, Landry? Dude. <laughs> I'm so ready. I'm I, so ready. <laughs> I hope it's not an Xbox game. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see in three, two, one. Oh, uh, come on. Pokemon. There we go. This is OG, right? Pokemon. I, see, I'm a Pokemon Blue guy. Okay. But what part of the what part of the game is it from? <sighs> it feels like main menu to me, but it might be just like the opening yeah let's let's go main menu you you got it right it's the okay. opening screen main yeah. menu you know whatever yeah like the very beginning of the game like okay cool on. sorry right. yeah you got right. it right. let's go dude 20 points Oof. for landry all right mystery dude, number five that is maybe the game i played the most in my life pokemon red or blue okay good no just blue okay i got my blast toys like level 99 i had no i was a kid i had no like guides or friends to talk to none of us did yeah none i of us just did. moved from texas to ringle georgia and i just remember oh. playing that like every single day on the couch so good so oh, many memories yeah yes. I, so that's that's good to know so i can probably play some more songs from that series in like different towns and see if you can guess them i didn't play i haven't i i played the next pokemon game i played was x pokemon x wow big jump <laughs> yeah big i just jump. waited for a long time like, my 99 <laughs> you probably didn't have very good. much fun you probably were like this kind of sucks i love pokemon x dude oh, okay good oh i'm glad you liked it yeah I, I know that people don't like that but i like that one a lot i like that all right <laughs> mystery number five for me i'm nervous landry <laughs> okay let's let's hear it i can't even remember what i put down all right and the hints are going to be game genre platform and console okay. and then first initial i think you're gonna, really suck. i think you're gonna nail both of these that was kind of loud when i played that on my side i don't know how loud it was for you oh but... it, it hit right for me okay good here we go oof that's loud oh the horns gave it away this is uncharted yes for sure but which uncharted that is a great uh, question. It was very or orchestrated and like it's like the big theme. I feel like this is just like the Uncharted Four like opening intro scene, like the music. <sighs> it's it's not four. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, it's I'm Uncharted. To, yeah, I'm trying to remember if it's in four. I don't think it is in four. It might be. Oh man! Well, you got to know this, Landry. What what soundtrack did you pull it from? Well, I know what soundtrack I pulled it from. But it's not four. Okay, so then I mean, I guess I, I guess I don't get any points because I didn't guess the right. I didn't guess the no, right. No, game. no, no. We'll, we'll give you points for uncharted. Half points. So half points. Uncharted. I get. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. What? Which? Which one is it actually from? It's it's Nate's theme, and it's it's on one, two, and three. But I'm not. I, oh. I'm pretty sure it's not in Uncharted Four. I was looking through Uncharted Four's tr soundtrack, tr and I couldn't find one that was iconic. Yeah, Nate's theme is, is super iconic. Yeah, I yeah. almost actually picked that for you. I was like, I wonder if Lander would know the Uncharted themes. I was like, he probably would. Oh yeah, dude. Uh, if it's Naughty Dog, I'm I'm like pretty You're much in. there. Unless yes. it's like Jack Two and Three, which I'm actually playing Jack <laughs> Two right now currently. So you I'm might get to... some of those things. Yeah, but uh, Jack and Dexter One, I got the that. Precursor Legacy. I love it. That, that game is so good. We are the precursors. <laughs> <laughs> so, every once in a while, you'll just do an impression. I'm like, dude, that is like literally a hundred percent on. I didn't know what those guys sounded like until someone told me I was. I sounded exactly like the precursors from Jack and Dexter, <laughs> and I was like, what? And I watched the video, and I, it, it's the exact same voice. That's so crazy. Ever it since really... the beginning of time. Yeah. That's there's it's, one of the it, characters in Crash has like the same voice too. It's so funny. Probably same same guy. Like we need that yeah. precursor guy. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Phase two. Let's jump in here. This is for you, Landry. You ready? Oh, yeah. Dude. First of all, this hits so hard. Okay, so I am like, <laughs> uh, 
first of all, I'll give you one little clue the, initially. Don't, don't give me a hint. No, this is just like that was like okay. a sort of reorchestrated version because I couldn't find the like original version. So okay, so wait, that that's tripping me up. I know. So that sounds pretty close to the original version, though. It's not like a eight bit thing. The the original song would have been like yeah, it's pretty close a, to that. An eight? No, no, it would have been like an eight bit um, sounding. Sorry, so I kind of missed. So I'm you. thinking like RPG, and I'm thinking, uh, I, not Final Fantasy, but gosh, I, okay. Give me uh, what's the first clue? Give me the first clue. I know you've. I know you've. Uh, uh, no, I know this song. It's like. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the game the game genre is JRPG or RPG. Okay. Uh, shoot, that didn't give me anything. I already knew it was JRPG. Jake. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, since uh, you already knew it was an RPG, I'm going to go no, ahead. No, no, no. Uh, no, I'll have to take a second clue if you're going to do that. Okay, so I'm going to go <laughs> with... Dang, man. Dun, 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 dun. Can I hear it one more time, please? Dun, dun. Yes, you may. Okay, let me. See. I just want to hear it like, like five seconds. It's JRPG. It's probably... Super Nintendo, I'm thinking... Is it final? F- no. So how many guesses do I get? I don't know. I mean, we've we never done like guesses. Give me the second clue. Give me the second clue. All right. Second clue is platform. So it is on a uh, Nintendo platform. It is a Nintendo platform. Okay. JRPG, Nintendo platform. So it's, I'm not, th- I don't think it's Chrono Trigger, but it's Chrono Trigger. <laughs> It is Chrono it's Chrono Trigger. Trigger. It's it Chrono is Chrono Trigger. Trigger. Okay. Yeah, it's totally Chrono Trigger. Okay. Sorry, I uh yeah, the, the orchestrated version kind of threw me off too. I was like, oh dang, I couldn't okay. find there was like 40 versions of Chrono Trigger songs, and I was like, okay, I just gotta pick now, but one. Now I have to close. tell you where it is at in Chrono Trigger, and I believe that's the overworld theme. It is. It's yeah. called like the the something the wind, something like the, the okay. something of the cool. wind. But yeah, that's this the, the theme that plays like in the overworld when you're walking around and stuff. Well nice done, nice. dude. Yeah, thank you. I'm pretty sure it's the same. Uh, I, I think Final Fantasy's composer and Chrono Trigger's composer are the same mm-hmm. person. So you got 10 Dude. points for that. And I'm sorry, I, I did throw you off with that reorchestration that kind of made it sound Dude, weird. that's lame, bro. But the theme the theme was there. And I was the like, The theme was there. You know, but I was thinking, this. like, man, that's got to be PS1 or above. Yeah. This sounds too good to be, yeah, off of, off of it, an SNES. It hit pretty hard. I need to find that version, actually. Yeah, it was Just pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. good. All right, last one. Here we go. Mystery number six. Here we go. Oh. I assume the automatic, I imagine. Easy. Super Mario 64 for sure. That's a... Oh, it's here's not, where it gets difficult. I almost feel like the same song is used in both snow levels. I know it's a snow level. It's either okay. Freeze Easy Peaks or it's um, Cool Cool Mountain. I'm gonna. I don't know if it's actually called Cool Cool Mountain, but I'm gonna, uh, go, I'm gonna go with that. It's the mountain level. Yeah, yeah the, the snowy mountain, mountain level. level. Yep. Yeah, the first, the first one there. Is, is that and what it's called, Snowy Mountain? I think it is Snowy Mountain. That's what the file was called. So. <laughs> Snow Mountain level in Mario 64. It's really hard when I rename them all mystery. Cool file Cool Mountain or... is what it's called. Oh, oh really? let's go, dude. <laughs> Ooh, well done. Let's go, dude. I don't know the name of the actual level. That's 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 big mood stuff right there. Dude, dude, impressive. We had a draw this what? week. No, we didn't, because I got ten points on one, and I got ten points on one because I didn't get I didn't get the right game on uh, Uncharted. Oh out. yeah, that's true. I just that's got true. Uncharted. I didn't get the actual game that it was from. So just thirty Nate's theme to thirty. 30 to 30, mano y mano. Well done. We didn't fail out on any of these. I like yeah. our new system where we can kind of give clues. I like it too. This is good. This helps. We'll have to come up with a tiebreaker in some way in the future. Ooh. If we can get it the fastest, like just pick a mystery song. Yep. How do we even do that? I guess there's probably like a there's probably like a playlist out there where I can just find like video game music and just click on one and see if, someone, <laughs> if we can guess it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we'll have to do something else. That's like, funny from a different uh some some other come up with some other game we'll tally we'll tally up all the scores at the end of the year and make it make it count then there we go that's there we that's go. what that's matters good. yeah all right man well good stuff yeah. unfortunately that is the end of our podcast y'all listeners 
What did you think of this this whole month of May? What were, what were your standouts? Um, are you looking forward to maybe playing Chrono Trigger with us? Uh, we'd love for you to join along. If you are doing that, let us know, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can write it again to bitcast at bitbloggers.com and submit reviews and any other questions there as well. Uh, Landry, where can the good folks find you on the interwebs? You can find me on x.com, at Soft Iconoclast. Hit me up about uh, Chrono Trigger, man. I will... I uh, will be playing, and I'll be happy to talk. I'll I'll post about it. I'll I'll try and tweet about it a little bit. Let's post about it. I'm excited to. Maybe we'll make a super thread. Me and you. We'll just we'll just talk about Chrono Trigger, and then we'll just talk about our experience so far. Sweet. We're gonna be playing on the analog pocket. I think we've decided yeah. each of us. Gonna try and share some screenshots from that bad boy. Maybe just take a photo of the analog pocket because it's so beautiful to look at. It is. Know? It is an above average machine. Above average. <laughs> It'll be fun. Well, I'm excited about that. And uh, yeah, looking forward to June. Hopefully it'll be a good month of gaming. And until next time, y'all, this has been BitCast. Thanks for tuning in. Let's talk about some stuff. <laughs>